I'm going to title this morning's message. It's an honor to be here for Alan and Joy this morning. They're out of town. And so uh, we're going to title this morning's message, Preparing for the Best. You've often heard the phrase, preparing for the worst. Sometimes in life we have some storms and some things come our way that need more prayer than we ever thought we could possibly need. So this morning as we talk, I believe that God has some better things in store for you than what you could have ever imagined. In fact, there's a verse in Ephesians chapter 3 and it talks about God doing exceedingly abundantly more, immeasurably more than we could have ever imagined in our lives. And I believe no matter who you are, why you came today, I believe that's for you. We're going to prepare for the best. James chapter 1 verse 12 says this. It says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. It says, blessed is the man who stands in the middle of a trial. Because at the end of that trial, he received the crown of life. Here's what this verse begins to teach us as we're seeking to prepare for the best, God's best in our lives. We have to realize that as we stand in the middle of the test, we're actually doing something. We're preparing. You see, when we stand in the middle of the test, it's not the final verdict. When we stand in the middle of the test, we're actually preparing for what God is about to do. When we stand in the middle of the test, we're preparing for God's best. I hated tests growing up. Y'all, any test haters out there? I I remember, um, you know, I I used to walk around telling people I was a terrible test taker. As far as I knew, I was. Like, I just didn't get good grades on tests. I could could do okay. I would actually turn in my homework, so that saved me. But uh, I wasn't very good at taking tests. I'll never forget my senior year of high school. I had this class called Humanities. Don't ask me what that means because I still don't know. But um, I had a grade that was just below the line. And and you know that just below the line feeling of I'm going to have to do something um, miraculous here. And so I made the decision to do something I had never done before. Study. (laughs) Teachers in the room, plug your ears, okay? You're not going to like this. You see, I had spent my whole life believing I was a test taker, but I had never actually put in the effort or the work to study for the test. I remember that I studied. This is truth. Some, sometimes people come up to me after service and they're like, you making those stories up? No, I'm a preacher. I can't make those stories up. Here, I studied for 11 hours. 11, y- y'all weren't as impressed as I was hoping. <laughs> You're like, that was like 15 years ago. How do you even remember that? I remember it because it was so foreign to me that I actually counted the number of minutes that I studied. And, and he, you know what I did? I actually got a good grade and I got college credit for the class and I didn't get in trouble. Praise the Lord, right? But here's the thing, I had spent most of my life so busy preparing for the worst that I never actually stopped and took the time to prepare for the best. Sometimes in our life when we take a look at the things that are going on, we can find ourselves easily pulled into the trap of seeing the negative, seeing the bad, of seeing the problem, of seeing the issues, that we get sucked into the trap of preparing for the worst instead of preparing for the best. You know the worst test in, in high school? You all remember the fitness test? The physical fitness test? It was the worst. Uh, you remember the sit and reach? You know where you sat on the floor and you had to reach out in front of you and touch a line and see how far you could test? I'm like, why is this even a test, right? The dear good Lord gave me these big old hammies and they're not going to stretch anymore no matter how much I practice for this thing, right? Then you got the pull-ups. You remember the pull-up fitness test, right? That was the most embarrassing one, all right? I'm going to stand in front of a whole class of gym class of guys, and I'm just going to hang from this pole, right? Because there is no going up, okay? But then it was the pacer test. You know the pacer test, okay? This will date you a little bit here, but it's like uh, they've done this for a long time. But you stood on the line in gym class, and they would play this beep, and when it beeped, you took off running. And by the time it beeped again, you had to hit the line on the other end of the gym, And it slowly picked up and picked up and picked up until eventually you're just laying on the floor, right? Here's the thing. Sometimes in our life, we expect to do bad. 
I remember walking into tests in the classroom. I remember walking into the physical fitness test in gym class, preparing, expecting to do bad. But can I tell you, although I'm not the most athletic person in the room, and I never did as good as I dreamed or wished that I could, I actually did better than I thought I would. Have you ever found yourself in the middle of a test or a situation, expecting something to go one way, and when you get out the other side, you look at it and you say, well, that actually wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. Some, sometimes when we're preparing for the worst, we get so caught up, and we miss the fact that sometimes we're actually stronger than we think. You see, what happens in our lives is that we get to this place and we get into these situations and these circumstances that start to scream louder in our head, louder in our mind, louder in our hearts, louder in our life. And we begin to wonder how we're ever going to make it out the other side. You see, it's in the middle of the test. You know, the test that you dreaded taking, the test you never want to take, that we actually discover how strong the Lord is inside of us. In 2008, there was a hurricane, Hurricane Ike. I didn't live in Texas yet, so you guys are much more familiar with it than I am, but hurricane, Category 4 hurricane, winds of 140 plus miles per hour. There was a community, community on Galveston Island that had 200 homes. And 199 of them were gone. You may remember this picture. It went viral. Here it is right here. Remember looking at this picture all over seeing the news, all over all the news stations. I remember seeing it. I wasn't from Texas. I remember seeing this picture. And you look at this picture and you see the utter devastation. But what, like anything, whatever you look at, there's always two ways of looking at the picture. See, so you look at this picture and you think, man, that is a lot of devastation. Or you could look at this picture and think, what in the world did that guy do to his house? You see, in the middle of the test, it shows us what's strong. In the middle of the test, in the disaster, in the devastation, it shows us what's strong. Matthew chapter 7 says this. It says, everyone who, then who hears the words of the Lord and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell. And the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on the house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. See, there is a strength that the Lord has about his words in our life. And we begin to prepare for the best instead of prepare for the worst. Some things begin to take place in our life. There are a lot of beach home owners who went from living the dream to literally living in a disaster. Your dream home on the beach you've worked your whole life for. In a moment, it turned into a disaster. And I don't know about you, but as I live my life, I don't want to move from a place of living the dream to living in a disaster. And when we prepare for the worst, that's actually what we're positioning ourselves to do. The Lord says, regardless of the circumstances and the things going on in your life, you can move from dream to destiny. You don't have to go from dream to disaster. But the big question on the table for all of us is this. If we're going to stand in the middle of the storms, if we're going to get stronger, if we're going to prepare for God's best, how exactly do we do that? I don't know if you realize, but the Bible is a couple thousand pages. There's a lot of good advice, a lot of good wisdom. And sometimes what you notice throughout Scripture is that there are some themes that run along it. In other words, there are some things that pop up in numerous occasions, in numerous people's lives, and we see that when we live our life that way, something begins to happen in us. As we read the Scripture, what happens is our hearts begin to prepare for the best, even amidst some of life's worst. I want to tell you this morning of a story of the people of Israel. Last time I preached, I preached out of Exodus chapter 32. Today we're in Exodus chapter 33 because for the last six weeks I've only made it one chapter. So here you go. Exodus chapter 33. 3,000 people had just died, literally in pretty much what you would call a civil war. They turned against each other in the camp because of the sin that had gone on in the camp. And at the end of it, to top it all off, if disaster wasn't enough, there was a plague that came upon the people. In the middle of bad news, have you ever gotten more bad news? 
ever feel like a pile-on effect? And in Exodus chapter 33, verse 3 and 4, we read, we read this story. God tells the people of Israel, he says, go up to a land flowing with milk and honey. In other words, he's saying, go into the promised land. The place I promised you long ago, it's time, let's go. And then he says, but I'm not going. I will not go up among you, lest I consume you on the way. You ever want to consume your kids on the car ride? For you are a stiff-necked people. Men, don't call your wife a stiff-necked woman. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. This was the dream they had been waiting on. Move into the promised land. They came out of Egypt as slaves. They just watched 3,000 of their brothers and neighbors and sons die. They just made it through a plague. And the Lord says, it's time to go to the dream. But in the midst of that dream, they found disaster. Because the Lord said, I cannot go with you. Because if I go with you, I'm going to literally consume you because you are stiff-necked people. Not exactly the word they were waiting to hear. In fact, the people were so distraught that it says they took off their religious ornaments and they they went on, their, their religious garb, and they walked forward without it. Can you imagine in the moment the despair, the the disheartening spirit in the camp? The, the feeling of being alone, the feeling of being abandoned. All of those things came as they heard this disastrous word. The Bible says that they began to mourn. They began to mourn the weight of their problems. Have you ever mourned the weight of your problems? The grief of the weight of the things going on in your life. Disaster, heartache, setback, failure. They began to mourn the weight of their problems. So they have a choice in this moment like we all do. They can prepare for the worst or they can begin to prepare for the best. Mourning the weight of their problems, they have a decision to make. Will they prepare to take personal responsibility for the things in their life? A couple of months ago, uh, I was sleeping. All right, When I sleep, I sleep. Okay, Don't mess with me. All right, I sleep deep, I sleep hard, but you know who sleeps even deeper is pregnant women, okay? My wife, man, she is just knocked out in the middle of the night, all of a sudden, wham, she whacks me upside the head. And when I came out of my sleep, I was so startled, I thought, you know, just that instant panic. And I looked over at my wife and I said, did you just hit me? And she goes, no. And I said, "Um, well, honey, then who did? And she goes, I don't know, but it wasn't me. And I'm thinking in that moment, all right, she's dead asleep. I'm thinking in that moment, I just need you to own what you just did. Sometimes in our life, we have these problems that come about. And the Lord is looking at us like he was looking at the children of Israel saying, I just need you to take some personal responsibility for the things that are going on in your life. If there's an area of your life that isn't working and you go to the Lord and he says, yeah, there's some stuff that you're doing that's got you into this position. The Lord says, I need you to take some responsibility and come before me and say, Lord, I'm sorry. You see, they're mourning the weight of their problems and the Lord is looking for them to take some personal responsibility for the things that they had done. They're also mourning mourning the loss of God's presence going with them. Which means they were going to have to reprioritize some things. They're mourning the change of plans. Man, this last year we had a lot of change of plans, right? And you know that feeling of we're going on this trip and it gets canceled. The feeling of somebody's coming over, I can't wait, and they cancel at the last minute. And sometimes in our life what we realize is we begin to mourn the change of plans. The Lord says, I need you to do this. I need you to make a priority about my presence. So here's what Moses does. There are people of God, they're mourning all of these things, and they find themselves in this situation. 
And they have a choice. Are they going to begin to prepare for the worst based off the disastrous word that they just heard? Or are they going to start preparing for God's best and continue to believe that God will do what he's always said that he would do? And then Moses steps up in this moment and we see a response out of Moses that we can learn a lot from today. Exodus chapter 33 verse 12 through 18 it says this. Moses said to the Lord, See you say to me bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said I know you by name and you have also found favor in my sight. Now therefore if I have found favor in your sight, Moses says, please show me your ways that I may know you in order to find favor in your sight. And consider too, God, that this people, this nation, is your people. And God said to Moses, my presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him a very intriguing statement. He said to God, if your presence will not go, don't bring us up from here. In other words, Moses is saying, wait a minute, God, I thought that was a part of the dream already. I thought that was a part of the package that you were going with us. I never even considered, God, that you wouldn't go with us. And here's what he says. Don't take us up from here if you're not going. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord Lord said to Moses, this very thing that I have spoken I will do for you because you have found favor in my sight and I know you by name. And Moses said, Lord, please show me your glory. I love Moses' response to the bad news. Moses' response was, wait a minute, God, I thought all along you were going with us. Moses says to the Lord, God, if you're not going, neither am I. I'm going to stay right where you are. You see, there's something I believe that Moses knew about the preparation. Moses knew that the presence of God was the thing to be valued above everything else. And so if you're looking to prepare your life for something better, if you're looking in your life for things to turn around or have a shift, you're looking for some fresh perspective, a new way of living, then can I tell you, the theme of the Bible is this. Wherever God is, there is life. In Genesis chapter 1, God literally walks with Adam and Eve in the cool of the garden. The whole thing starts with God being with his people. The very opening of the New Testament. Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, opens the scene with the Savior of the world coming to be with his people. All of scripture says this. That God's best happens in our lives when he is with us. You've got a problem that feels big, start inviting the presence of God. You've got a situation you don't know what to do, start inviting the presence of God. You've got kids that are wayward and you don't know what to do about it, start putting them in the presence of God. Why? Because it has the power to change everything. So my challenge to you, number one this morning, is this. Move into the presence of God. Move in. Press in to the presence of God. Another way to say that is this. Start seeking the presence of God in your life. I remember when I was in college, uh, I was an RA. I worked in the dorm. And I, I was an RA before my wife Courtney had become an RA. And the year that she became an RA, everything changed for me. Um. I was in it, you know, to serve the guys, and all of a sudden this pretty girl comes walking in. I, everything changed for me. In fact, I remember uh, they had this radio that would sit in the office, and if something needed done, they would radio over uh, the radio and say, hey, can somebody please come help? And I remember sitting inside the office listening to the radio even when I wasn't on the clock because I was listening for something. I was listening for the Spence dorm, which is where she worked, to call and say, we need somebody to come fix. Oh, I'm on it. Uh, they, they'd radio over, hey, we're out of toilet paper in the girls' dorm. Yeah, that's a common occurrence, right? And f- what would I do? I'd hustle down to the janitor's closet. I'd be over. Every chance I had, you know what I was doing? I was putting myself in her presence. Why? Because that was going to change everything for me. And it did. Here's the thing. I did whatever I could to be in her presence. And the Lord asked the same question. 
Are you willing to do whatever it takes to put yourself in the presence of God? Because when you do, it changes everything. Here's what Moses did. Moses prepared for the best because he spent time regularly in the presence of God. The Bible actually even says in Exodus chapter 33 that there was a tent outside of the camp. And inside of this tent, Moses met with God on a regular basis. It says that if anybody needed something from the Lord, sought out the Lord, they would go to this tent where the presence of the Lord would show up. And I was so intrigued as I read this passage in Exodus chapter 33, it says this. It says that when Moses got up and left the camp and headed toward the tent of meeting, that the people would stand up in their doors of their tent and watch. The people would stand literally in their doors as Moses left the camp to go meet with God, and they would watch. And then something would happen. Moses would meet with God. He'd seek God. He'd move into the presence of God. And the presence of God was so thick that a cloud would cover the tent. And the people who were standing in their tent watching could see the presence of God fall where Moses was. And it says in Scripture that in that moment something began to happen. The people no longer watched in their tent doors. You know what they did? They worshipped. You see, here's what began to happen. As the presence of God showed up, they stopped watching and started worshipping. If you want to move into the presence of God, we have to make the decision to stop engaging in a spectator sport. To worship. If we're going to move into the presence of God, we're going to have to stop coming for entertainment and start coming to church on Sunday morning for an encounter with God. Something powerful happens there. Pastor Allen says it all the time. If it's personal, it's powerful. And so what happens in our lives when we move into the presence of God is that the, the stuff sets to the side because we're so overwhelmed by who he is, what he's doing, his power and his glory and his majesty that everything else fails in comparison. You're looking for something better than move in. Proverbs chapter 8, verse 17 says this. It says, I love those who love me, and those who seek me diligently will find me. The Lord has a promise for you that if you move in, if you press in, if you seek after him, you will find him. Matthew, or sorry, Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6 says this, For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and rewards those who seek him. He rewards those who seek him. In your life, if you want to move from dream to destiny, away from disaster, then you're going to have to move into the presence of God. The second thing is this. Start asking for the presence of God. Start asking for God to go with you. I'll never forget my youth pastor when I was 12 years old telling me, when you get in the car, imagine yourself buckling Jesus into the seat next to you. I know it sounds corny. I know it sounds cheesy. But I never forgot it. What he was trying to say was this, that wherever you go, God is going with you. I'm thankful that this is not the book of Exodus any longer. You see, we're not going to a tent outside of the camp waiting for God to come down in the form of a cloud. Why? Because when Jesus came, something happened. The Holy Spirit came. And when the Holy Spirit came, he lives inside of us, which means everywhere that you go as a follower of Jesus, he goes with you. So when you find yourself in those moments and you feel alone, and you feel like you're in a place of despair or discouragement or things are not working out, it's not because God has left. It's because we have lost the perspective that he is right there. We have to make it a priority to put ourselves in the presence of God. And when we do, we start gaining the perspective of God over the situations in our life. When you make the presence of God a priority, it gives you a fresh perspective. Um, some of y'all are better in the kitchen than me. I'm um, not very good, but, um, you know, my whole life I've always thought, you know, you clean up after dinner and it's a mess and as you go and 
Um, by the way, I'm pulling my youth pastor card out, okay? I got an illustration. You ready? Here we go. Th- this is going to be worth all the money that you, you know, paid to get in today, okay? So uh, I, if you've ever found yourself in those situations in life, you, you know, you're just, you're just trying to get dinner cleaned up and, and get it ready. And, ugh, these stinking boxes are just such, oh, oh, hang on, sorry, I messed up my illustration. Just kidding. I did it on purpose. You ever found yourself in those situations in life where you're just like, really? Really? Come on now. Like, does it have to be like this? I'm just trying to clean up dinner. I'm trying to get the, the daughter bathed, and I'm in bed, and I'm trying to go to bed myself. And you find yourself in life, and you're like, this is just a mess. Saran wrap is even worse, people. <laughs> and so you find yourself in this situation just trying to get something done. I was today years old. When I learned that the maker of the Reynolds foil box put little tabbies on the side. Oh, I'm about to blow your mind. And when you press these tabs in, you know what happens? It holds the foil in place. Come on now. Amen, somebody. You see... Here's what happens in life. As things come and we get pulled, all we have to do is realize that the creator of this box designed it in such a way that when you have the right perspective on how to use it, when you get a fresh perspective, it doesn't matter if you're 50 years old. You can go home and do this today and it will work for you. What happens is this. We realize that when we get a fresh perspective, it changes everything for us so that when the storms of life come and we find things turning into a mess instead of falling all over the place we turn to the Lord and we say I need your presence in my life and your presence is going to give me a perspective on the situation that I'm going through right now and what happens what happens is powerful and it changes things I've worn these glasses my whole life. I had glasses in third grade, but they were the tortoise shell, you know. I used to get made fun of them, so I quickly turned to contacts. Little did I know that tortoise shell glasses were going to come back in style. I should have saved them, but here's the thing. If I take these glasses off, I struggle to see. I know, I was real smart, right? You're like, why didn't you pass all your tests? I put the glasses on, and all of a sudden everything becomes clear. Moses says to the Lord, I would rather stay in the wilderness with you than go into the promised land without you. Because here's what he knows. That he would rather be in the desert, in the wilderness, in the dried up places, dreaming of what could be as long as God was with him. Because he knew that if God was with him, things around him would be so much clearer. The right perspective comes out of the presence of of God. You're looking for something in your life. Can I tell you, Moses was in the same situation. And here's what Moses had going for him. Moses knew the scripture. He knew the promise of God for his life. You know what else Moses knew? Moses knew the power of God. He had been in Egypt. He saw God single-handedly destroy the Egyptians and take his people and redeem them. He had seen the power of God move. But you know what he wanted more than anything else? The presence of God. More than anything else, he wanted the presence of God in his life. And so he did something so simply profound. He simply asked God to show him more of who he was. And the Bible says that the Lord honored that request. God took Moses up on the mountain and hit him in the cleft of a rock, and God passed by him. And when God passed by him, things changed in Moses' life. He came down from the mountain with a word from the Lord. He came down from the mountain with a perspective for the people, seeing clearly that even though they saw the disaster, he could see the destiny that God had wrapped up for them in such a gift. We have to ask for the presence of God in our lives. Go tomorrow morning 
and take 10 minutes at the beginning of your day and sit down and read Bible 365. And end after you've read the word and, and say, hey Alexa, play some worship music up in here. And you sit there and you just say, Lord, I'm not in the church building, but you're with me. Lord, I don't have it all figured out, but you're with me. Lord, when I go with my coworkers today and they bring up all this drama that's been going on, would you remind me that you're with me? Lord, when I feel like screaming at my kids today because of all the things they did this weekend or didn't do this weekend, would you remind me that you are with me? And what happens is he shows up and your perspective on life changes. If you want to prepare for God's best in your life, then you're going to have to invite his presence in. And the final thing is this. As we read the scripture, here's what I love. Moses said, how in the world could you not go with us? Because it is in your going with us that we are actually known. In other words, all the people of all the other nations look at us and say they are the marked chosen people of God. Moses says, if you don't go with us, what's going to happen? In other words, Moses said, we're about to have an identity crisis, Lord. If you don't go with us, we're going to have an identity crisis. Number three this morning is this. Make it a priority to be known in your life for the presence of God. Do your kids know that you invite the presence of God everywhere you go? Do your coworkers know that there is a light about you that is different than anything they had ever seen anywhere else? I'll never forget, I moved here, and I had been here for about a month. And I drove a big old truck, Texas style. You know, I moved to Texas, I had to buy a truck. And... Um, one day I took this uh, truck in for an inspection, a little bit of a tune-up, and as I dropped off the truck, I came back to pick it up. And when I picked it up, I hopped on the interstate, and I'm driving down the interstate at about 70 miles an hour. I'm getting ready to get off on the exit ramp, and I go to hit my brakes, and they didn't work. I'm driving down the interstate, my brakes aren't working. I pull off on the side and coast down the side. Now, I know you think I'm a pastor and supposed to be holy and stuff, but there's a lot going through my mind in this moment. I'm thinking... Um, I took a perfectly working truck to the mechanic shop. He gave me a $2,000 bill, and now it doesn't work. And so I went back to that office, and I was as holy as I could be. And I pulled in to his mechanic shop, and I told him everything that I thought. And I just said, hey, here's the deal. You're going to fix this, and I'm not paying for this, and, and who, what could have happened, and I am going off on the guy. All right. Oh, man, you got I'm, I'm changing perspective of me. It's okay. Sometimes my life looks like this, okay? And I'll never forget the question he asked me. He said, so where do you work? <laughs> Dark. <laughs> what do you do? Oh, man. I'll never forget it in that moment because the Lord spoke so tenderly to my heart. I was afraid that I was going to get fired a month into this deal. Because you know what he said? He said, my family and I, we just started going there. I haven't forgot it. We're to be known for the presence of God going with us everywhere that we go. Which means our witness, even when we are wronged or things get messed up or there is disaster and destruction looming for the things in our life, that we have to be known for the presence of God. When people see your life, when you ask for him, when you move in, there's going to be something different about you. You are a child of God, chosen and marked by him. And Moses knew that. I'll never forget the time in my life when... Uh, I was in high school, and a girl came up to me at the end of the year. When she came up to me, they were doing the yearbook signing, you know, where you go around and sign everybody's picture and have all these signatures that you'll never look at ever again um, sitting in your attic. And, uh, but I'll never forget that day this girl came up to me, and I didn't really know her name that well, and I hadn't known her very long. And she asked me a question. She said to me, she said, why are you always so happy? I remember thinking in that moment, I'm not always happy. I got stuff going on in my life, but I realized something. It wasn't that I was always happy. It's that everywhere that I went, the Lord went with me. 
And when you live like that, the perspective on your problems goes away. Joshua chapter 1, verse 9, we're going to end with this scripture and I'm going to close. It says this, Have I not commanded you to be strong and courageous? And do not be frightened and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Every time he tells people to be strong and courageous, he says that my presence is with you. If you're looking to prepare yourself to be stronger for God's best, then whatever you do, please take the presence of God with you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that we are not alone. We thank you so much that you go with us. We thank you so much that you are faithful. And right now, we just come to you, and we invite your presence to move and work in our lives. We wouldn't be who we are if it wasn't for you. We couldn't do the things you've called us to do if you don't go with us. And so right now, we invite and ask you to move in a way maybe we've never seen before. Do immeasurably more than we could ever imagined. Lord, we invite you to move and work. And right now, I want to give an opportunity, maybe for you, maybe you've never said yes to Jesus, or maybe you've been far from him. I want to give you the opportunity to step into the presence of God for the first time. It's time to stop watching and time to start worshiping. If that's for you, would you just slip up your hand? You want to say yes to Jesus. You want to come back to him. Thank you. I see your hands over there. And you want to come back to him. You can say yes to him right now. And we're going to pray this prayer together. And we believe that God is faithful to hear our prayer. Can we pray this together? Dear God, I know mankind needs a savior. I know I can't save myself. So Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. And that God raised you from the dead. So right now, I confess you as my Lord, as my Savior, as the one who forgives me and restores me. Thank you, Jesus. My past is forgiven. I have a relationship with you. I'm a new creation in Christ because I said yes to you. Amen. Thank you. If you prayed that prayer today, we want you to know that's the best decision you could have ever made. We love you. We're praying for you. God bless.